So I'm Jacqueline Burkell, and I am uh, with Jane Bailey, co-lead on Working Group 3 in the ACT project, and I'm here to moderate a panel. Well, I won't be doing much moderation, so I'm here to facilitate a discussion on court data creation and management. And with us for this panel, we have Michelle Mann, General Counsel of Justice Canada, David Tate, Professor at Western Sydney University, and Paul Embley, Chief Data Officer of the Nevada S Supreme Court. We were also supposed to have Harold Epineuse, but unfortunately, Harold could not be with us, so we are three instead of four, and we'll be mighty. So I just want to take a little bit of time to give a brief introduction to each of our speakers, and I guess I'll preface it by saying it's, we are going to switch the lens a little bit right now to talk about specifically about court data. Uh, that is maybe narrowing the lens slightly, because I think we've been talking about all forms of data. Um, and really, it's, it's interesting because like everything else, data gives and get, data takes, or there are positive and negative consequences of access to it, of collection of it, of uses for it, and that's one of the things that we want to explore here. So Michelle Mann is General Counsel with Justice Canada, Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada Legal Services, focusing on technology and digital law. She's a co-chair of the Justice Canada Artificial Intelligence Working Group and chair of the Justice Canada E-Commerce Technology Law Study Group. Michelle is the Justice Canada business lead of a partnership with IRCC to pilot an AI-powered legal technology for tool for immigration litigation support, and that's what she's going to be speaking about today. She's also a member of the Law Commission of Ontario's AI advisory panel supporting its digital rights project. Michelle's practice includes advising on applied AI projects where AI is used in administrative decision making and on AI policy issues. Michelle started her career in private practice and has previously advised the departments of then Human Resources and Skills Development Canada, Health Canada, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. Michelle holds a BA from the University of Saskatchewan and a JD from the University of Manitoba, and she's been a member of the Law Society of Ontario since 1994 and the Law Society of Manitoba since 1989. She'll be our first speaker. Our second speaker will be David Tate, and he is a professor of justice research at Western Sydney University. For 2022, though, he is on sabbatical at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. I'm jealous. He received his PhD from the London School of Economics in Social Science and Administration. He coordinates with Diane Jones the Court of the Future Network, which undertakes research, runs conferences, and organizes court tours in Europe, Australia, and North America together with the French Judicial Research Institute. He's led six experimental studies about court technologies and spaces, examining interactive visual evidence, remote witnesses, iPads for jurors, the prejudicial effect of the dock, distributed courtrooms, that is remote participants appearing in correct positions with localized sound, and virtual courts. He is currently part of a project in partnership with the Fraunhofer Institute and organized through the University of Montreal, developing an immersive virtual court platform for use on justice hearings and working out how this facility may impact fairness, sense of presence, and quality of communication. And finally, we have Paul Embley, who is the Chief Information Officer of the Nevada Supreme Court. He began his career in Silicon Valley working for the who, who's who and the who's no longer. <laughs> After 25 years in the not-for-profit sector, Paul has shifted to the public sector, or sorry, in the for-profit sector. Paul has shifted to the public sector to work on integrated justice. He has gleaned broad product life cycle expertise from diverse and challenging projects in the US states and territories, Australia, many EU nations, and several emerging de democracies, including Haiti, Jamaica, and Nigeria. He has led justice-related IT assessments and technology initiatives, ranging from child welfare and terrorist watch lists to online dispute resolution. He continues to follow potential disruptors such as blockchain and machine learning data science, looking for ways that those disruptors might be used advantageously in courts and with justice partners. He is currently involved in both day-to-day -day and strategic initiatives for the Nevada courts. He's working and hoping for the day when justice is truly accessible to all. I think that's something we're all working and hoping for. We're going to have each of our three panelists come up and give a brief presentation, 10 minutes or so, and then we will engage in a discussion. I have some prompt questions if, if they don't come from the audience, but given what I've seen already, I suspect that I will be silent and I'm ready. Okay, so Michelle, can I turn it over to you? 
And your slides are up. Too many tools in this era of tools. And none of mine have been working for the last 12 hours, so it's going to been an interesting uh, ride. I finally resorted to having something printed in case they failed yet again, so <laughs> bear with me. Thank you so much for the invitation to join the panel uh, today. It's a pleasure to be here with colleagues. Um, and I just want to qualify my remarks, as we always must, that these are not official positions of the Department of Justice, just uh, views on topics uh, as we explore them today. There's much discussion you heard this morning already. I wasn't here last night, unfortunately, but you heard this morning about the benefits, positive and negative, of AI in the legal tech sector. And, and we have started talking about access to justice, uh, impacts on the administration of justice, unequal access to AI resources, uh, and other potential impacts, bias and discrimination, privacy, intrusion, and the like. Uh, as a kind of case study in these issues as uh, Jackie mentioned, I'm going to speak today. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay. Uh, I'm going to speak today about uh, a project that we've been... I just asked if you... Can you hear me? Yes? No, it's good. Oh, for recording? Oh, okay, there we go. Tell me if now I'm too loud. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so we're go I'm going to speak to you about a project that we have been working on, and it's a partnership between the Federal Department of Justice and Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Canada. I'll refer to them as IRCC. And what we are doing is seeking to harness the power of AI technology to assist in immigration litigation and immigration law generally. And I'll explain in the, in the coming minutes about what exactly that's going to look like. I, I just want to note that the pilot doesn't have as an objective to study access to justice, administration of justice, bias and discrimination, like that wasn't the purpose of this project, but we are very much alive to the issues and paying attention to how it might intersect in our project and solutions. Where we've seen that intersection, what our solutions are uh, to those uh, uh, possible concerns. And I look forward to people's feedback on that. Uh, we're all ears. So let me just see if I can advance this. Yeah, I'm using the side button. There you go. Oh, it's line by line. Yeah, oh, you gosh. Have, you have uh, animation on your slides. Okay. If you push together, the title will come up. I, would. I wasn't even paying attention to the line by line part. All right. Okay. So, a high level uh, background. We are wanting to use. Let me stop by explaining, first of all, just a super. 10 second of how the litigation works. So we have people that apply to the immigration program for all manner of visas and the like. And we have officers that are employed in the Department of Immigration who make the decisions on the applications. Those decisions on applications, I probably stepped too far back, didn't I? Those decisions on the applications can then be judicially reviewed by the federal court. So if someone does not like their decision on an application, they file a judicial review application with the federal court. There's a hearing, pleadings are filed, FACTA, et cetera, and the judge makes a decision, and a decision is issued by the federal court. We're talking about using that case law, the decisions of the federal court, and using AI to analyze those decisions of the federal court to assist in the preparation of litigation. So the litigation has already been filed. And why are we doing this? We, what are our expected results? We are hoping that we will see some interesting, insightful uh, information from using an AI-powered tool and that it, it will assist us both in managing litigation and in actually formulating uh, positions and arguments. Let's see if this will work. we go, okay. Okay, uh, so why are we doing this? IRCC is the most heavily litigated department uh, in the Government of Canada. It accounts for 60 to 70% of the federal court docket. 
So that's a lot of litigation, and so the thinking is surely there are tools that we could use to assist in the management of that litigation for, for the benefit of all, all, and I'll explain in a moment how we get to that part, the benefit of all. Uh, we know that there are tools developed by private industry for other uh, areas of the law that are similar to what we're aiming for. Blue Jay Legal out of the University of Toronto has uh, a tool out there called Tax Foresight. In the tax law domain, they have one for employment law. So, you know, the, they exist, but there isn't one at the moment for immigration law. So we are trying to really fill a need. We see a gap and we're trying to fill a need. And what, in the bottom line, what we're going to test here is whether that body of case law, immigration law, is conducive to analysis using AI, because not every data set works with AI algorithms. You have to annotate it, you have to prep it, but even then, it doesn't always work and it doesn't lead to productive outcomes. So that's really what this is about, is first and foremost testing whether it will even work on the case law data set. Uh, in terms of scope, it's important to know what we're doing and what we aren't doing here. Um, as I said, it's a litigation support tool. What that means is it's not a tool that we are intending to be used by the front end officer making the decision. Uh, this is something we thought about. We asked, and I'll talk to the procurement in a second, we asked industry about whether if we built a tool to assist our litigators and our client officials that work with the litigators and the counsel that work on these files, if we built a tool for that purpose, could it be used by the frontline administrative decision maker on the incoming application. We asked that question of industry, uh, but we've taken that off the table because it raised a lot of policy concerns that we, we needed to keep this focused on the core purpose here, which is a litigation tool. It was never within scope to have automated decision making for frontline decision makers for this tool to be used for that purpose. That was never in scope, although it was erroneously reported uh, as such, I won't get into that because we can talk about that later if you wish. Uh, we've chosen one uh, type of application because you have to, with this approach that we have in mind, choose one. It's not a tool that would analyze any possible immigration law decision. This will focus on a certain type of application for humanitarian and compassionate uh, consideration. We're also using, as I've mentioned, case law data, publicly available case law data only. We aren't using other data of applicants. We aren't using other IRCC data or Department of Justice data. We're just testing what you can do with case law. Yep. I'm, I'm getting it slowly but surely. And so as I mentioned, uh, we want to use it to assist us in, in managing litigation. We want it to see if it will generate more comprehensive and faster analyses. So if you think of it this way, instead of counsel based on their level of experience getting an application for judicial review, reviewing it, thinking about the state of the case law, what are the arguments, what's the strength of the case, that's how the normal process, right? They might work with a paralegal to do some research or do their own research. Those are the normal steps and it all leads to a lawyer advising uh, the department of IRCC on the, uh, uh, giving a legal risk assessment. What are the strong arguments? What are the weak arguments? What are the chances that you will win or lose? So that's the traditional approach that you'd see. And we're talking about putting a tool in the hands of those litigators and counsel and client officials to really assist with that process. And what's a key distinction is that this type of tool will, will actually review every decided case. So every decided case, all that data will be brought into that assessment. So it'll be a more comprehensive uh, assessment, at least from that perspective, subject to the limits of the technology, which we will see as this unfolds, if in fact it will produce, and we've asked that a, a narrative is part of what we want produced. We don't just want an answer, we want a prediction, win-loss, 88%, this application will succeed. But we've also asked that the tool provide us a narrative that explains why, the basis for that assessment, the key cases that are in support, that kind of thing is what we've asked as part of the functionality. And obviously, out of this, we undoubtedly will see insights that human review may not have revealed. And that's where it gets interesting. Are they insights that are the throwaway anomalies? Well, what, I don't know what that means. I'm not sure why the data would show that. Or are there actual insights that a lawyer who understands the area of the law would find interesting? 
in terms of the a, a development or a trend in the case law that that had not been picked up or was not understood. So there will be some interesting um, information. Okay, in terms of high level functionality, I think I've basically explained, except I will also add that it will also not only produce these little research memos with a prediction, but it can also then that annotated data set. So the case law will have to be annotated because it sits as unstructured data right now. It'll have to be annotated to be ingested and trained by the AI algorithm. But that annotated data set will then be available for research. So a much deeper dive would then be available, which, will, which could prove to be very interesting, I think, for users to have a deeper dive on the case law to perform their legal research. We've also asked that trend analysis and litigation be like a reporting feature, if you will, as the cases grow and more cases are added to the data set. We would like to see what trends uh, might be revealed. For instance, are we consistently losing cases with these parameters? If so, what is the court telling us and we need to re-examine our policy positions or the program parameters or the like? So it's a, it's a, it's a way of uh, reflecting on trends in, in litigation and also broadly what's happening with litigation volumes uh, and, and other trends that might be revealed. <clears throat> and to, to get this, so we've, we've structured, and I'll say this a couple of times, we've structured our uh, procurement in a way that we will get milestones and deliverables from the contractor. So we will actually get delivered as a separate deliverable the components, one of which will be the annotated data set. One will be a prototype. One will be the final operating system so that for reasons I'll explain, we wanted to make sure we had these in our hands and not in the control of, uh, of a contractor alone. I'm going to skip by this. Here's our procurement history. It's long and sordid and painful and I have the scars to prove it and I don't want to talk about it, so I'm going to skip right on by and move on to the most interesting uh, part. I don't know how long I've been speaking, but I'll just be a couple more minutes, uh, Jackie. The interesting part about the procurement, if you look at that later at your leisure, is that we, there was a lot of transparency built in. We went out to industry twice formally through a request for information, a notice of proposed procurement. Uh, we posted the RF, RFP. Uh, we've then had two bidder engagement sessions. So this is, because this is AI and the technology is evolving as fast as we are talking, uh, we wanted input from industry to make sure that we were seeking to build the right thing and that we were asking for something that could be built so, you know, at a high level. So that's really the purpose of that and basically transparency. So in terms of policy considerations, <clears throat> um, the Government of Canada has the resources to take advantage of this technology, creating the potential for a resource advantage over individual litigants. I'm sure you've already thought this through as you were sitting there listening to this. And this has the potential to negatively impact access to justice and administration of justice and create unequal access to AI resources. This may lead to a perception that, you know, there's an actual unfair advantage in defending the litigation. And if un left unchecked, it could be perceived as creating systemic disadvantage to vulnerable and under-resourced individuals. So we developed some concrete solutions to address this. First of all, and these are on two slides, so I'll maybe skip back and forth a little just to test my ability to run this thing. We, uh, as I said, we're going to get components of the tool delivered to us as part of the deliverables. Uh, after the in, uh, uh, and after the initial test period of a pilot, a short pilot of only six months, our intention is, assuming it works and it, it, it's actually a successful tool, we will turn the components around to outside the government of Canada, whether that's legal aid organizations, other levels of government, private industry, law firms, if they want to take the components and build a solution, uh, that's for them to do. And we'll make, make all the information available subject to protections on personal information contained in the case law, which I'll speak about in a moment. And why are we doing this? All of these solutions that I'm talking about are about leveling the playing field because we don't want the Government of Canada to have an unfair advantage and impact the administration of justice and access to justice, but we also do want to step forward and, and take the step of testing the technology and see if it will work in this domain that has a high, high rate of litigation. 
So we're going to make the components available to those who want it. We also made sure that we put in very broad intellectual property licensing provisions in the contract to make sure that we weren't impeded from doing so. And we intend to hold our contractors' hands in the fire on those uh, because they're very clearly stated and we spent a lot of time on that issue. Not me, I'm not an IP expert, but we spent a lot of time on that issue with uh, intellectual property experts. So our hope is, as I've stated, that this technology, whatever we come up with coming out of this pilot, could then be used by uh, others and lead to better informed litigants on all sides and a more equitable approach to litigation and informing yourself. And, and the, the points that were made this morning by uh, Daniela Piana about um, you know, uh, leveling the playing field with the distribution of information and the technology. So this is what we are trying to do and hopefully a byproduct will be reducing the caseload of the court because the, it will hopefully, you know, narrow a little bit the volume of litigation if people are more informed about the likelihoods and the arguments and the success of, and the likelihood of success of their case and what the court has been saying. They will have more information in hand. Just a couple of comments on bias, and then I'll stop talking. Um, I mentioned that studying litigation trends is in scope of the project, and we've asked the tool be designed to permit that kind of study. It was not intended that the scope of this project be used to study bias and discrimination trends in judicial decision making or that of the frontline officer, either at a macro level or on an individual level. That's not the purpose of the project. That would require a very careful project and a careful approach to that sort of data and, and the use of that data. And that's not what we're trying to do here, but we're very much aware of the issues. IRCC has its own anti-racism task force. It is already unpacking as an organization in government very actively uh, the potential for discrimination and bias in their operations and in their program delivery. So that work is already ongoing. And I want to be clear, I'm, I'm not saying that we're not interested in trends, you know, in bias and discrimination, whether at the individual decision maker level or across the macro trends in the data. But, you know, it has to have a proper analysis in, in the proper context uh, and, and be done carefully. And that's really not our scope for this project. Our imperative here is we don't want the tool to be used to profile and take strategic advantage of decision-making patterns of individual judges. Uh, that would bring the administration of justice into disrepute if the justice litigators were using it in that way. So we prohibited uh, this functionality in the tool uh, so that individual decision-makers cannot be profiled. So that's directly in our uh, contract. And in terms of bias, we've imposed on the contractor that in their activities, in building this tool, that they take measures to ensure that they don't embed additional other bias uh, in the way they develop the tool. And, and we're going to do an algorithmic impact assessment under the Treasury Board mandatory directive that would require various steps, even though we probably fall outside of it for a matter of transparency and due diligence. We're going to do that. We've already done a privacy impact assessment that will be uh, you know, concluded once we have the tool. From a privacy standpoint, I would just say that we have put protections in the contract. We are fully aware that there's personal information in case law. It's publicly available, but it's nonetheless personal information. There's an interesting case in Canada, the Globe 24H, you can look up and I can talk about with any of you later if you'd like, that made us very alive to the dangers of having large annotated case law data sets available in the public domain. So we won't drop that into the public domain. We will restrict that. They, people will have to sign agreements with us to get access to that where they will be restricted from using it for nefarious purposes as our Romanian friend did in that case. Thank you very much. Great.
but you can't find it. Don't, don't worry, I can do it without it. It's no big deal. No, forget it. Okay, because yeah. I, okay. I don't appear to have the file here. No, that's all right. It wasn't where you, it wasn't where you imagined it. Okay, so could I, could I first of all um, apologise? David Tate wasn't able to come to the session. My name's Winston Smith, and I represent the Ministry of Truth. And I'm going to be explaining to you the importance of surveillance. And just to get you into the mood, I'd like you all to look into this camera, which is, keeping, is going to collect information about you. Now, you might think, what sort of information? Well, one of my mentors can declassify official documents just by thinking about them. <laughs> now, we're going to declassify your minds and figure out what you're thinking, but you need to look into that camera and I'll report at the end what you've been thinking about. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing is talking about various forms of surveillance using um, and creating court data, and I'm going to argue for it. I think it's a wonderful idea and there should be a lot more of it. And I'm going to be looking at um, some of the areas where um, we're underusing court data, in particular um, types of data. And then I'm going to be looking at methods that could be used more widely. Um, you know, we've only got a partially surveillance society. Really, China is so much more successful with its social credit system. In fact, social credit came from British Columbia. Did you know? It was a Canadian invention, and now the Chinese have picked it up and they're operating, and we're going to reapply it back to you again today. Okay, well, well, let's start by a bit of surveillance over governments. Well, we're nervous about this. We think in the Ministry of Truth, we don't really think the government should be surveilled, should be above it, but all the same. Um, there was a, a recent case in Australia, there's a Royal Commission into a robo-debt inquiry in which people um, were sent debts that they didn't owe and some people committed suicide and the government tried to suppress it and some of the documents in the tribunal were redacted. And so there's a Royal Commission into this. Now, of course, from our point of view, the Ministry of Truth, we would rather it didn't come out at all and people didn't know about it, but once it did, we need to clean it up in order to appear more respectable than we really are. Um, now, let, let's talk about some surveillance over courts and tribunals, and, and particularly judges. And I know in France they're a little bit squeamish about individual information about judges. Well, we think it's a good idea and there should be more of it. Um, so here's one example of something that we did, you know, as part of the sentencing committee of the Ministry of Truth. And it's looking at um, discrimination against Aboriginal people in terms of over-imprisonment rate. So we looked at the unit record data for judges within courts within regions in terms of their use of imprisonment. And we, could, um, and we looked at what was it to do with individual characteristics of the judges, of the court, of the type of people, and what we found was it was basically there were regional disparities to do with access to alternative community services. So as a result of this surveillance, we were able to recommend to the government, and they partly do it, but governments never entirely follow um, recommendations, they increased community options so that magistrates in particular could use those options instead of imprisonment. But that was an important use of unit record data about judges themselves. Um, then there's another example, 20 years earlier, we were looking at um, magistrates in Victoria and the use of family violence orders. And um, it, my role in that was to work for the chief magistrate to go around looking at individual magistrates and what they said to women who said they'd been, you know, beaten up by their husbands. And some of them said, you know, go back home, it's normal, there's nothing to see here. And so we reported that back and the result was, you know, over a long period of time, now the only magistrates who are allowed to hear family violence matters are ones who are specially trained in the jurisdiction and have support workers accompanying them. So again, it was important to look into what might be, you, some of you, you know, people who are freedom lovers might go for, uh, think that's a breach of privacy, but it actually it's a very important use of court data for that purpose. Um, 
Now, let's look at um, resource surveillance. It's something that isn't uh, looked at um, probably enough. Um, prosecutors, um, since they've been digitising their data, we can track how, oft how long their presentations take. And it seems to be a reduction in time of about 15 to 20 per cent in court cases because of the better preparation that prosecutors make. And this is uh, estimates from the Victorian Juries Commissioner. So it seems to be quite important to keep track of the types of technologies that prosecutors use. Um, a second example of that would be um, looking at uh, resource surveillance um, and we're looking at juries. Now, as I look around here, there's nobody asleep yet, but, you know, there could be. And so one of the indicators you sometimes have is how many jurors fall asleep during a trial. Uh, now, there's a, a story, it's probably apocryphal, but a judge was going on and on and on, doing a big summing up, and one a juror fell asleep. And the judge went over to, well, the judge asked the other juror sitting beside him, he said, excuse me, would you wake up that juror? And the juror said, no, you're on it. You send him to sleep. You wake him up. <laughs> so, but, you know, the, the issue about, you know, people dozing off in court is actually a really a resource issue to do with the quality of the air circulating. That's one of the main reasons. So that's part of it and partly the quality of communication. So if you can keep track of dozing behaviour during court, you can actually use that to improve the quality of the environment and keep track of the communication techniques used. Um, then justice facilities. Um, it, in, during COVID, there's a lot more um, issue about the pressure on courts. So in Australia, what they often do with criminal trials, they'd have one courtroom for the hearing and one for the jury deliberation. So give them a lot more social space but that meant that all the civil disputes, and we don't really have um, jury trials very much for civil matters, um, then they were put online. Uh, but in order to do that, in order, you really need to keep careful track of room occupancy. And jurisdictions are really nervous about that, and they won't let, won't let anybody know. I'm talking to somebody, an architect in Ontario, who was designing new courts, and he couldn't find room occupancy rates for the existing courts. And it's because they're underused. And so, um, you know, room occupancy rates should be available in order to better project um, what's going to happen. Um, then judicial outcomes. Um, well, one interesting um, study by Rand was about uh, whether you need to keep people in pre-trial detention before an immigration hearing. And they showed that if you had some sort of case management, people were just as likely to turn up as if you kept them in detention. Now, that's a really important piece of information because it avoids people who are very vulnerable uh, being stuck inside detention centres. OK, so that's my first issue, you know, some of the ways in which uh, we could increase surveillance by making better use of court data. Now, um, collaboration with academics. Now, as you know, academics are notoriously fickle and can be bought off by the highest bidder, and we're proud of it. It's an important part of our uh, identity. Um, and so we work with courts to get data that could be relevant to their uh, functioning, particularly if we get credit for it and they talk to us nicely and feed us well. Um, now, so let's look at one issue, safety risks. Um, we did a comparison of how, safe, how people are greeted when they come into courts in South Australia and Victoria. Now, Victoria, you have these security guards who don't know anything about courts, who are kind of buffy figures, who are basically security people. And, and they, everyone feels nervous when they go in, and they feel even more nervous when they pass through security. South Australia, what they did is they said, well, we don't want anyone with any training in um, security. No police, no army, nothing like that. We want women who are trained in sales and service and hospitality. So most of the people on the door when you go into court in South Australia are women who smile at you and say, how can I help? 
And so by doing this comparison between different jurisdictions, and then people are much more relaxed when they go into a South Australian court. So, you know, we've got evidence that actually the recruitment process makes a lot of difference to the experience people have. Um, jury management. Um, Jane Delahunty um, led a study about how jurors are satisfied and what the issues are. And one of the issues was actually um, was to do with how judges treat jurors and how they ask questions in order to, for people to be excused. And in some places, um, the, the judges talk to people privately or they ask, they'll accept that they have a reason why it's not appropriate for them to be on a trial. But there were a couple of judges we came across who, if somebody said, no, I don't want to be in the sexual assault trial, the judge would say in the front of 50 people, you've got to tell me why you won't um, take part in this trial. And that was traumatic for the people concerned, and we documented it, and it's a bit of complaints that, you know, how dare we stigmatise judges. But nevertheless, they changed their practices as a result of that. Um, fairness. Well, you know, our main work is on showing that the doc is prejudicial, and so we've got good experimental evidence to do that. Um, but there's lots of other things you can look at um, as well. Um, one of the issues of fairness when I was doing an evaluation of the men of mental health tribunals for the Ministry of Truth, um, we looked, we, can, we didn't tell them what we thought, we just observed how different tribunal members ran a hearing. Now, most of the male members in a mental health tribunal started off by describing the mental health condition the person had, so they, they lower and lower and lower, and by the time the tribunal member had finished, the person was crushed, because it described all their symptoms and the things they'd done and the medical condition, and they felt like they were nobody. Whereas most of the female members had a little chat to the person and told them, you know, discussed how they were and what they were doing and what their interests were, and the, the person sort of sat up more and they were able to participate effectively. So we didn't comment on this, we just described these two approaches and then at a hearing, you know, with all of the tribunal members, we said, which one do you think is most appropriate? And of course, they changed. Okay, um, now, technological impacts. Um, well, we, we did look at iPads for jurors, you know, random, they, the good thing about Australian courts is really strong cooperation, you know, it's because the Ministry of Truth controls the whole thing, but um, so that um, if we want to have a jury um, experiment, they give us real jurors from the jury pool, they call more people, and then when the jurors, after they've called enough for a trial, they say, now, you can either sit around here for four hours and wait and do nothing, or David Tate, or you know, Winston Smith in this case, has got a, a, a little trial about, uh, well, he didn't, they wouldn't tell him what it's about, um, would you like to do a, an experiment? So, so we randomly assign them either to use an iPad for looking at evidence, or paper, and then compare the difference. Um, so that, that's an example. And now to my uh, third point, which is about using a wider range of methods. Now, obviously, administrative data is great. You can do it, and, um, and that's often collected, but it does need to be standardised. And the important thing is to try to get it comparable across jurisdictions. So a lot of our studies in the Ministry of Truth are trying to compare different um, parts of Australia and see how well they work, and, and then try to figure out what, what the, what's the difference. So, for example, in South Australia and the Australian Capital Territory, prosecutors are more likely to dismiss charges and not take them to court than in other parts of Australia. So we're kind of interested, why would that be so? Um, and, but having that data means it's possible to at least ask the question. Um, and uh, there's a whole lot of other methods too, but um, I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, ritual analysis, trying to look at the rituals people engage in and, and how they work. And, the ones that we did that we enjoyed most were um, with indigenous courts. And they have a way of basically acknowledging the, the person, uh, recognising their country, giving them to talk about themselves, uh, linking in the elders. And, and, you know, whereas most court cases, if you listen carefully, about 90% of the things that are said about somebody are negative. 
whereas in these indigenous courts, 90% of the comments are positive. And so that's the kind of thing we document in order partly to justify having more of these types of alternative tribunal. Um, and then just mention um, unobtrusive measures. There's all sorts of ways you can collect additional information. Like jury managers say something that they use is the number of tissue boxes they have to put in the jury room. And that gives them a clue as to how traumatic the, the jury deliberation was. So it's just one, one measure that they, they think is relevant. Um, another one that um, we used, I w walked around the court in Nantes with, um, with Antoine Garapon and Catherine Taylor, and Catherine noticed the graffiti. And there, so there's quite a bit of graffiti. I thought it was a beautiful courtroom, but she said, no, look at all the comments people make. And it was partly because in that court, the architect thought it was a good idea to remind people that Nantes was a centre of the slave trade. So all these slogans all over the place, you know, remind it in their face. And they even projected it onto the water at one stage. So people, the townsfolk, would remember the slave trade and their role in it. Um, but the, this sort of graffiti indicated that some people weren't entirely happy with being reminded of that grubby past. OK, well, I think I'll just check on my... Um, yes, we've got the, the figures in. We've been tracking your mind and what you've been thinking about. And we, we can now report on what you were thinking about. 10% um, of you were thinking of, about emails, either you've received or you need to send. 20% uh, were talking about food or sex. And the rest of you were, were thinking that um, I was trivialising George L. Orwell's critique of the surveillance society. So, thank you. All right, we're going to test how good the cameraman is, because I am not a podium person. Ready? OK, a few things uh, to start out with. Uh, so if your eyes are closed, I know it's because you're praying for me, OK? And I'm OK with that. Um, uh, I've been working with uh, court data for 20 years, data for probably 40 or something like that. Um, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about U.S. court data. Your mileage may vary depending on what country you're from, but um, a lot of countries have the same issues that we do. So with that, let's see. Okay. So in the U.S., um, you may or may not know that each state uh, gets to determine, well, let me back up a little bit. So any guesses as to what percentage the federal courts uh, of the cases, uh, 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 federal courts here. Do any of you know in the U.S. what percentage? Come on, somebody has to give give a guess. These are the all courts. Yeah, all, all cases in the U.S. How many are heard at the federal level versus state level? Okay, well you're a little bit low. So it's about it's about uh, two percent uh, of the cases. So. So when you see all these grandiose things coming out from federal courts, know that they had about 18 people working on that case versus uh, you know, the half person or the part-time person that we have. So uh, in, in the states, uh, we have centralized courts. Uh, so like a Utah, a Maine, uh, they have uh, one court system that filters all the way down. So when the uh, chief justice of the state Supreme Court says do X, they all kind of uh, follow that. Uh, when you go to someplace like Texas or Nevada, uh, where I'm uh, currently, um, you have decentralized, meaning that each county kind of runs their own shop. And so I can encourage people to do things with their uh, data, but they can also say, eh, not today. Um, so um, another big issue is quality of data. And, and so I'm going through all the problems with data first to get this out of the way, okay? And then we can talk about how wonderful the court data is that you actually can get. So, so quality is a big issue. Um, I was on a call yesterday uh, where we were discussing a, uh, you know, the process and a citation that comes in 
if it has incorrect data on it, can a clerk actually correct that data? And there are some legal people who would say, no, I mean, that was the original charging document. You can't change that. Well, you know, what if they, um, you know, put the wrong cord in? Can that, that be corrected? What if they put the wrong color of car in? You know, they use the wrong uh, initials and all that. So quality of data is a very, very big thing for us. Um, and that's one of the reasons why courts are hesitant to share with you, is because they know their quality is, I won't use the word, but uh, they, their quality is pretty bad. Not my job. Now, I know all of you researchers would love to know how many left-handed EV drivers ran a stop sign at 403 yesterday, okay? But the clerks are gonna say, not my job, you know, to collect your data for you. So one of the things that we try to do is we try to figure out how can we incentivize people to collect data that wouldn't normally be part of their job. Um, when I worked in Kentucky, um, I was this big data hotshot and I thought I knew everything there was to know about data. And we were talking about juvenile data and um, I was thinking of some of the more populous areas, but uh, we wanted to do a report and somebody said, no, we can't do that. And I thought, well, why can't we do that? And they said, because you get out into the rural counties, they will have one case for a juvenile. And when you publish that, everybody knows who that is and they know, and all of a sudden they know now the details of that particular case. So when we talk about anonymization of data, I get how we can do that, but sometimes even when you anonymize it, people know what the data is really telling them. So we need to be very cautious and cognizant of that. Um, if you ever hear somebody say, well, it's against the law or the statute or it's against a rule or it's against a regu regulation, what they're doing is they're just hiding it. Uh, they don't want to share it with you. And it's probably because they don't want to share it because of uh, number two there, the quality of the data. Um, overlapping, conflicting authority, we have that all over the place. Who can share what data? Um, can we, the courts, share data that was collected by law enforcement? Can law enforcement collect uh, information and share information from the courts and so forth? Um, elected officials, um, I don't need to say anything more about that. It's a problem. Uh, funding cycles. So uh, in Nevada, um, I actually get a, a, a two-year budget. So uh, my legislature meets every two years. So as a technologist, and you'll all appreciate this, as a technologist, I have to figure out what technology is going to be doing for me in four years from now um, when I do my budget. So I'm this great magician. If you need stock advice, please see me because I can predict all kinds of things. But so funding cycles are very real. And depending on where you ask for data in that funding cycle, you may or may not uh, get it. Um, at the end of last year, all of a sudden, I magically had $800,000 to spend. Uh, you know, in a month, of course. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, the funding cycles really do matter when you're asking about data. All right, let's go uh, real quick, because I want to hear your questions. I, le I learn more from you speaking than I do from me. So, so uh, limited IT, um, over half my staff is contractors because I can't find IT people. You know, uh, poor me, and if you want to send your resume my way. <laughs> Um, uh, approval processes uh, can take long, can be, uh, um, right now in the states we have uh, these threats of violence against public officials that uh, affects the quality of the work and what people are willing to do. Um, I, I know none of you have this problem, but in the states we really have an uneducated public that doesn't know what courts do, doesn't understand uh, court data and so forth. Uh, personally identifier information, um, that's a big issue. If we release stuff, uh, we can, um, and, and this is one of the areas where I really like what the federal courts do. Uh, when there's a, an electronic filing that comes in, they automatically uh, have AI looking at that and redacting the information. 
Um, in state courts, when you file, it's on the filer. And so, can you guess what's in our court records? Uh, things like social security numbers, things like credit card numbers, things like names of children, uh, names of juveniles. So, uh, that's a real big thing. And then, then obviously, uh, when we talk about business, uh, there is a financial impact if a, uh, especially if like a decision can be leaked or something like that because people make money off of court decisions. Okay, so let's get to the good part real quick. So we have all kinds of uh, great data. I was uh, talking to David um, a little bit earlier and we know that when we do remote juries, so uh, nobody is in the court uh, house, and uh, we have sent iPads out to the jurors and they are participating remotely. We know that we have a more diverse jury pool than if we bring people into the court. Um, it's one of those great things, it's a great data set. Unfortunately, not everybody's flocking to do that. I don't know why, but uh, but uh, we have a lot of data, and especially now that we've done remote courts, we have this really, really rich data set that uh, a lot of things can be determined from that that we'd love to see the research on. Um, the last thing um, is uh, uh, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. Uh, one of the things she said is the beauty of uh, data standards is that there's so many to choose from. Um, and so, I will tell you, in the States, um, we are trying to follow this thing called NODS, which is the Na National Open Court Data Standard, um, but there's others that you may be familiar with, uh, whether that's OASIS, or whether that's uh, Measures for Justice, or uh, Justice Counts, uh, you know, I could name a whole bunch of them, but there are a lot of good court data standards out there um, that are actually, this one specifically was designed to help researchers. So you could be able to go to a court uh, in, a, in a state and be able to say, can I get this in NODS format? And the idea is that they would be able to provide that to you.